Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Wherever you are throughout the world, happy World Kidney Day 2022. My name is Cam Kalantarzadeh, a practicing nephrologist based at the University of California, Irvine or UCI and Veterans Affairs or VA Medical Center in Long Beach. Hence, I'm greeting you today from Southern California. I'm also privileged to be one of the two co-chairs of the World Kidney Day Joint Steering Committee, along with Professor Robin Langham, who is uh, my counterpart, co-chair uh, from Melbourne, Australia. The World Kidney Day is, a sec is the second Thursday of March of each year, and is celebrated and acknowledged as an opportunity to increase education awareness about kidney health. The importance of kidney care is underscored by the fact that at least 10% of the adult populations of virtually all nations on earth have chronic kidney disease or CKD. The theme of Working Days 2022 is about te teaming up to bridge the knowledge gap that exists in kidney health. Today and throughout 2022, we will highlight the important role of health literacy in kidney care and universal precaution approach in providing health literacy, engaging individuals and organizations alike. These educations include such themes as the primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention of kidney disease, which was the theme of 2020 World Kidney Day, Living with Kidney Disease and Empowering Patients and Care Partners, which was a theme of 2021 World Kidney Day, and Strengthening Resources for Improved Health Literacy in Kidney Care, which is this year's theme of World Kidney Day. We partner with renal support groups, kidney foundations, renal networks, nephrology professional societies, and other stakeholders towards the goal of bridging the gap in kidney care knowledge and education. So please join me to celebrate World Kidney Day 2022 as we start our program now today with two brief introductory presentations by Dr. Agnes Fogo from United States, the president of the International Society of Nephrology or ISN, followed by presentation by Dr. S.F. Louis from Hong Kong, China, the president of the International Federation of Kidney Foundations, uh, or World Kidney Alliance or IFKFWKA. Thereafter, there are uh, eight to 10 uh, short presentations by colleagues, including kidney patient, le patient leaders, Ms. Veronica Martinez from Mexico, a kidney patient leader who shares his kidney journey with us. Professor, Professor Ann Bonner, the Dean of the Nursing School in Brisbane, Australia, a renowned expert in health literacy in kidney care. SF, uh, Dr. SF Lu, who is the IFKF president and we'll then continue with the keywords to be to connect and to be connected. Ms. Beatrice Segun Agbula, a dedicated nurse from Nigeria, talking on how kidney healthcare professionals can be engaged on health literacy. And then Mr. <clears throat> Paul Lafine, who is the ISN Advocacy Director and, work kidney, and uh, one of the Work Kidney Project Directors. Let's start with the presentation of Prof. Professor uh, Agnes Fogo. Greetings. I am Agnes Fogo, president of the National Society of Nephrology, greeting you today from Nashville, Tennessee. I would like to extend my warm welcome to you on the occasion of World Kidney Day 2022. The World Kidney Day was launched by the International Society of Nephrology and the International Federation of Kidney Foundations in 2006 to broadcast a message about kidney health to the public, government officials, general physicians, allied health professionals, individuals, and families. Over the past 17 years, World Kidney Day has grown ever stronger in celebrating different aspects of kidney health every year. In this year's theme, we recognize the importance of improved health literacy to close the persistent gaps that exist in kidney care worldwide. We commit ourselves as the kidney health community to the important task of providing a facilitating environment where we communicate and educate effectively 
in a co-designed partnership with those with kidney disease, rather than viewing lacking health literacy as a patient deficit. We're extremely pleased that all of you can join us in this webinar. The presenters range from professionals to patient representatives, and will cover important issues that are key for improving kidney health for all. I am once again so very pleased that you're with us and welcome you. Now, I am honored to pass on to my counterpart, Dr. S.F. Liu, the president of the International Federation of Kidney Foundations, World Kidney Alliance. Professor Liu, over to you. Good morning, good day, good evening, whatever you may be around the world. This year, the theme of World Kidney Day, Bridge the Knowledge Gap to Better Kidney Health, is important and timely. We call for action by everyone, the renal community, the public health policy maker, and most important, the healthcare professionals. The special editorial of the March issue of Kidney International highlighted health literacy. It is the degree to which persons are able to, and organizations equitably enable individuals to have the ability to find, to understand, and to use information and services to inform health-related decisions and actions. The term organization health literacy may not be familiar with you. It is a relatively new approach to address health literacy. We are most grateful and Bonner who enlighten us on this topic today. IFKF and Wellkin Alliance takes the view that the healthcare professionals that are the doctors, nurses, and other health, and the healthcare providers, the renal units and hospitals, and healthcare organizations such as kidney foundations all have an important role to provide healthcare information to the public, patients, and carers. We propose a five rights approach. The right information in terms of content and context being provided at the right time when they need it, by the right source that's trustworthy and factual, in the right format that is understandable, through the right channels and platform, most accessible by the receivers. Today, the webinar will address some of the gaps and the way forward. We hope you'll find this webinar both interesting and useful. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Bogo and Dr. S.F. Louis. With this introduction, we're going to continue now with Ms. Veronica Martinez from Mexico. She's a kidney patient, kidney patient leader, and she's going to share with us her story of kidney disease, what also could be known as the journey through kidney disease with family members and others. So let's listen to Ms. Veronica Martinez. Hello, everyone. My name is Veronica Martinez. I am a lawyer from Mexico. I am 44 years old, and I am a mother of two. Lucia, who is my older, oldest daughter, she's 10 years old, and Emilio, my little boy, who is six years old. I have always been in love with life. I love its challenges. I love its amazing surprises, its tough lessons, and its overwhelming force. I'm a family-driven kind of person. I am strong-willed, I am caring, I am determined, I am energetic, sensitive, empathetic, extremely curious, and a little bit too bossy, if you ask my closest ones. My health issues began as early as the fact that I was born with only one kidney, a condition called renal agenesis. At 13 months old, I was also diagnosed with vesicoureteral reflux, which caused severe renal infections and pain. This situation brought me to my first date with an operating room, one which became many along my life. The surgery was extremely successful, but by the age of seven, the infections had returned. And on the advice of my doctors, 
I had to give up gymnastics. Not only one of my most endearing passions, but one that I was very good at to the point of making the national team. It was then as a seven year old kid mm. that I had to acknowledge the fact that my health would have to come first in my life, even before fun time with friends, sports and family trips. Ever since then, my health has indeed implied certain level of sacrifice and commitment. The kidney infections returned once more when I was 17 and they lasted all throughout my last year of high school, then college and all the way through the first months of my master's degree in Madrid resulting in an average of three hospitalizations each year and numerous and painful treatments. Through those years, I was very fortunate to be surrounded by my family, my close friends, and some significant others who were nothing but empathetic, supporting, and loving. I have to say that as a kidney patient, there is nothing more important than to have this emotional support system around you. While living in Madrid, I was advised to see a Spanish urologist who I went to meet with. I have to say with very little faith, since I had already seen almost every single specialist in Mexico. Surprised by being asked to follow a different course of treatment by this doctor, I finally overcame the worst infections and I was at last able to enjoy my life without fear of falling in a hospital bed every now and then. However, previous infections and strong antibiotic treatments that I had been taking all my life had caused severe damage to my kidney and I was diagnosed with kidney failure in 2011. I have to say that I see this as an enormous bless blessing in my life since kidney failure is, as you know, a silent disease. I was very fortunate because you should know that I adopted both of my kids and when we started the process for Lucia's adoption, my eldest, they asked for some uh, medical studies uh, and we had to give them to the association so they could approve our health and that we were fit for adopting. Uh, as a result of this medical studies, they found out that I had kidney failure. So as I tell Lucia all the time, she's my lucky charm because it's because of her coming into my life that I found out about my disease and I was able to treat it at an early stage. Uh, as I said, these medical tests proved that I had kidney failure and I was uh, on a blood pressure treatment for about four years. This treatment was very helpful and it was uh, very good for my health because the transplant was a five years after I, I had the transplant five years after I was diagnosed with the disease. So it bought me five years with my original kidney and I was very thankful for that. Uh, since, as I said, kidney failure is an asymptomatic disease, I would have never found out about my condition in time. This is the reason why I see the miracles in life and the happy coincidence or whatever anyone might call it. And this was what Lucia's homecoming was to me. 
going through a kidney transplant is a journey, I have to say. It would definitely take a lot more words than the ones I can pour into this event to describe it. But if I could go back in time to the early months of 2015 before my surgery, I would definitely tell myself that if I could be brave and determined enough to face every single step and challenge of the process, I would be amazed by my own inner power, my resilience, and by all the extraordinary things that life would bring in this second rebirth. In spite of the times when I would think that it was too hard to bear and the fear was too strong to handle. My cousin gave his kidney to me and it was not only his decision, obviously, he's married and he's a father of three and his whole family became part of the decision and also became part of the process. Today, I can assure you that during this experience, I got to know myself in so many ways and perspectives that made me evolve as a different person, much closer and true to my spirit and my inner self, with a keen feeling perspective of life, the value of health and positive relationships, and of the immense treasure of opening my eyes every morning with the necessary energy in my body and the will to go about in my life with my family, my job, my loved ones, and my endless passion to live fully and freely. It is my interest to share my experience, hoping that my lessons can, can help others going through the same situation and can also raise awareness among society in general on the, important, on the importance of better understanding this condition, which is so common these days, and how preventive measures can become essential to achieve long-term health. Chronic kidney disease has become one of the main challenges in the public health system in Mexico, due to the increasing number of cases and the high investment costs of its treatment. Other elements that contribute to this challenge are limited number of specialized, specialized human resources in my country, late detection, and high mortality rates. In Mexico, the three main causes of CKD are diabetes, overweight, and high blood pressure, which are responsible for two thirds of registered cases in my country. According to the National Institute of Statistics, CKD is the number 10 cause of mortality in Mexico, with almost 14,000 deaths a year. Only 3.1 of the population that need a kidney get access to a transplant. As you can see, these are overwhelming numbers. To this date, Mexico does not have a national registry for CKD patients. We only have statistics which do not reflect the reality of the country's situation and therefore limits the ability to establish proper public policies and to address the problem financially. CKD is an issue that demands collaboration and institutional cooperation from all different sectors, health, academy, government, NGOs, and also requires the involvement of the general population and conscious and participative patients. Education and preventive culture need to become a priority when designing public policies in the health sector. Patients need to be placed at the center of this equation. They need to be considered in every decision and solution since they are the most valuable source of perspective and empathy for those who don't suffer from the disease. We need to raise awareness 
and we need to build a communication bridge between doctors and healthcare professionals and patients. This is where us as patients become strategic for the future of the health care system and the management of this disease in our countries. Thank you very much for this opportunity and I am honored to participate in the event. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Veronica Martinez. It was a very um, touching and, and educational uh, uh, journey that you share with us. So before we start discussion, let's move on with uh, Professor Ann Bonner, who presents the next presentation. Uh, Pro uh, Professor Bonner, Dr. Bonner is the Dean of the Nursing School in Brisbane, Australia. She's a renowned expert in health literacy in kidney care. She has contributed enormously in this area. And we are thankful to Dr. Bonner for uh, especially uh, expertise, her expertise and helping us, guiding us towards the 2022 working days team. Dr. Bonner, please. My name's Anne Bonner. I'm talking to you from Brisbane, Australia uh, for World Kidney Day, uh, bringing the knowledge gap to better kidney care. And I'm here to talk to you about the importance of health literacy. Now, I have no disclosures to declare and my presentation outline is fairly simple. I'm just going to uh, explain about health literacy and then talk about the implications for people with chronic kidney disease what's important for us as uh, kidney healthcare professionals, and also what's important for healthcare uh, services and organisations. So first of all, I think it's really important to understand what is not health literacy. It's not simply, health literacy is not simply about having particular functional skills, such as being able to read, um, or to be able to communicate in a particular language, to be able to watch a DVD, or even um, go on the internet and, and look for websites. That is not health literacy. Health literacy, according to the World Health Organization, is both a cognitive and a social skill. And it's about our motivation and abilities to gain access to information, to understand information, and to use information in ways that we can use it to maintain our own health. Now, this definition has been around for a couple of decades, but I guess as uh, clinicians, we tend to default to that functional understanding of health literacy as being able to, to read um, information, which is not the case. So just a little bit of a potted history about health literacy. It's been around for um, over 50 years um, and it's been you know, first mentioned in the literature um, in the 1970s. And then through the 1990s, it became more of a mainstream idea. And this is where when the WHO definition came into being. But, you know, over time, our understanding of what is health literacy has evolved. And now it's considered to have this, if you like, dynamic or changing um, ability. So it's no longer this fixed ability in terms of maybe being able to read and speak um, a language, but it's this fluid state. So in other words, it changes based in the context that we face ourselves. So normally I'd like to consider, you know, as as kidney clinicians, we have good understanding of health literacy in the kidney sphere. And, you know, often we speak at that much higher level. But even ourselves as highly trained health professionals will um, be faced with um, health situations, maybe of our own or of our family members that we don't understand. So we're placed in a different context to what we know. And much is the same for patients and their caregivers. They might be used to a particular context, perhaps managing their diabetes over a, a number of years, a number of decades. And then all of a sudden, as you know, things change and happen because of diabetes and cardiovascular disease occurs, then chronic kidney disease. And all of these 
change and or add to the complexity around healthcare. So that's what I mean by the healthcare uh, context does change. So therefore, our health literacy is context specific. So now the definition about health literacy is that it's multidimensional. It has that functional capacity about being able to read and write and, and to count and to speak in um, a, a language. But it's then being able to use those abilities to communicate in an active way in our healthcare. So it's not only as a patient being able to communicate, but it's also as the clinician being able to communicate. And then what is that communication is about is an exchange of information. And then the person receiving information is taking it on board, <clears throat> digesting it, and then being able to critically use it so that they can participate in their own health. So health literacy helps people to understand the risks and benefits of treatments, communicate with their healthcare providers, make a decision about um, the information they've received. And part of that decision-making is how I'm able to adhere to the required treatment that I've been asked to follow. So health literacy very much underpins, if you like, someone's ability to adhere to complex treatments. And that's what we have in chronic kidney disease. So fundamentally what we see in the literature guiding um, clinicians practice are studies that have used functional um, measures. So to measure um, adult health literacy using these various um, instruments that I've got listed here, the Realm, the Toffler, the New Vital Signs, and there's several others. And they've been formed parts of systematic uh, reviews. And, and this is very much what you see in the, the kidney literature underpinning our practice. However, that's not measuring or trying to understand the full picture of what health literacy is. So very much nowadays, we're using multidimensional measures of health literacy. <clears throat> and one of them is called the health literacy questionnaire. It's a patient reported outcome measure. It's freely available in multiple languages, um, over 40 languages. And, and it is also recommended by the WHO. But what I've got here quite simply shows three recent studies, and they're not the only studies that have been done, um, conducted in Norway, Australia, and Vietnam. And even though these are vastly different contexts, different healthcare systems, uh, different um, country incomes, there's, there is similarity around um, health literacy abilities. And these are all borderline sort of middle of the road sorts of um, scores. And of these multiple dimensions, there's uh, four of them that are similar regardless of um, the country. So what we see though in some countries are some of these areas, some of these domains are much lower than um, in other countries. But we need more research about this to fully understand that interplay between an individual's health literacy abilities and the complexity and demands that we see in the health and healthcare system. So having spoken about health literacy as being about the individual, but it's also about the environment, the environment in which the person and the healthcare providers are working and operating together. So now healthcare services need to make it easier um, for people to access understand and use information and services. And it's about taking a universal precautions approach. So there's some other literature coming from the EU and also a study uh, which I conducted identifying that it's healthcare systems and professionals who are key to improving health literacy in chronic kidney disease. Global initiatives um, and policies do exist from the WHO, for example, here uh, in the US, taking a universal precautions approach, a top down from organisations down to the clinicians, the healthcare team and um, uh, patients and their family. So it's very much seen as the organisation's responsibility around healthcare. And in Australia, all of the hospitals and healthcare systems are accredited to basically take patients and standard two 
talks about health literacy and it's seen not only from a patient perspective, from a clinician's perspective about communicating, giving good ed education that integrates health literacy, but it's also about the systems in the organisations. So what we see is health literacy, ha literacy having moved from just only the personal, but also to the organisational. And it's these coming together of these uh, two areas that are really important and driving health literacy for the future. So now's the time to shift that paradigm, shift it from focusing as a patient problem, a patient deficit, to a deficit that we might have in healthcare organisations and as health kidney healthcare professionals. So we should be thinking about it, what are we doing um, to integrate varying um, health literacy abilities. By doing that, we're more likely to provide health care to, to people with um, chronic kidney disease that's person-centred rather than disease-centred. So that's why it's now time to take action, to um, provide information to patients and caregivers as it's their right. It's accessible, it's understandable, it's the responsibility of healthcare providers and health policy makers. Social media does have a, a role to play, but again, it should be um, guided by the best available evidence around health literacy strategies. And so that information is accessible to all, not just a portion of society. And fundamentally, it's about improving the quality of communication by kidney healthcare providers to better support patients and caregivers. Thanks very much for your time. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bonner. Again, we're very fortunate to have you. We're going to have questions and, and discussions. In between, we are fortunate to have Professor Fogo joining us. We listened to her important introductory remarks. And we have two presidents from ISN and IFKF here, the founders of the World Kidney Day. Uh, uh, Agnes, anything you would like to share with us? Or... I just think it's a wonderful emphasis for us to focus on how we can encourage and enrich and make sure that patients are active partners and understand what we're working together with to achieve better kidney health and better health in general for all. So often we say things and we think that they are understood and that they mean something that we intended to mean. And that this is a wonderful step forward to remind us that it's our responsibility to make sure that what we want to communicate is actually happening and that it's meaning something to the patient in a positive partnership way. How well said. Thank you very much. That was excellent. So relevant to what we do and what we'd like to achieve. With that in mind, in, with that in mind uh, we're going to switch to the presentation by Dr. S.F. Louis, the uh, IFKF WK president. He's based in Hong Kong, China, uh, with the uh, presentation with a uh, catchy keyword to connect and to be connected, World Kidney Day 2022. Dr. Lu. I will speak on to connect and be connected with the kidney patients. The editorial of Kidney International March issue highlights an important message. Health literacy is a degree to reach persons and organizations have or actively enable individuals to have the ability to find, understand, and to use information and service to inform health-related decisions and actions for themselves and others. I will focus on the issue of how to find information. The Healthy People 2030 um, expanded the definition of health literacy from the personal health literacy to the importance of organizational health literacy, adopting the definition that the personal health literacy is contextual and that organization play a critical role by making health information and service easy to understand and assess. That is a very important role of the healthcare professionals, uh, the doctors, nurses, and healthcare uh, and I have, and also healthcare providers as well. I take the view that there are five rights in the provision of healthcare information. That is the right information in terms of content and context at the right time for the 
for those who need the information, but the right source that is trustable, trustworthy and factual information in the right format that is understandable through the right channel and platform, which is most accessible by the receiver. Indeed, our journey uh, of the kidney with ourselves is a lifelong journey. From the beginning, we need to know about the kidney function, protect your kidney, aware who is at risk, aware of the symptoms, how to make a diagnosis. Once you actually, unfortunately, got a diagnosis of kidney disease, you need to know how to manage it, how to treat it, uh, how to slow down the deterioration. And if unfortunately you move on to end stage kidney failure, you need to know more about the different options of renal replacement therapy, but further on how to plan for the future. So indeed, there's a different health and healthcare information to require for different people and, and patients at different times, from general public to patient with kidney disease to end stage kidney disease. We have conducted a survey to try and understand what the patients with kidney disease actually want to know, need to know, and where do we get the information from. So we asked them three questions in the survey. This is a part of the survey. Do you have enough healthcare and medical information about your kidneys and kidney disease to care for yourself? What kind of healthcare and medical information on kidneys and kidney disease, tumor kidney disease, and living well with kidney disease you want to know? This is a topic from last year, working the day. Where you have obtained and where would you prefer to obtain the best healthcare and medical information on kidney disease and treatment? So the surveys was conducted either on a hard copy, as is shown here, or actually in a chronic on, on the online web, on an online platform in English, uh, in Chinese and in Spanish, but you can actually select a country that you can form as well. A total of 11 organizations of IFKF working on ICE from 10 countries that actually take part in this pilot survey with 3,000 uh, returns. Um, they are mainly patients with kidney failures on dialysis, uh, although some of them are just with kidney disease. Because of time, I can only present the data as a whole group. Of course, we need the subgroup analysis to understand about more of what the information the patient needs when they're at different stage. Do you have enough healthcare and medical information about your kidneys and kidney disease to care for yourself? The overall score is 6.4. The average is 4.9 to 7.4. On what kind of healthcare medical information of kidneys and kidney disease you want to know? 50% of them actually want to know the common cause of kidney disease and failure, 41% on how do I protect my kidneys, and 34% on kidneys and, and kidney functions. Also, of course, there's important topics like am I at risk, the symptoms, and am my kidneys okay or not? On the information for treatment of kidney disease and failure, 30 to 80% of them actually surprisingly want to know more about if there's any other alternative medicine which is a bit of a surprise, 37% on complication of kidney disease and 36% on the information on transplantation. I also want to know about other things about when to start dialysis and other specific treatment as well. On the information to live well with kidney disease, 54% of them actually want to know how to live well with kidney disease, how to eat well with kidney disease in the field of last year. And they also want to know how to keep fit as well because they also need to know more about the artifact uh, elements as well, psychological stress, how to care for myself better, social support, and reduce the harm and uh, reduce the impact on the family as well. On listing the three places where they have obtained the, the information, 85% said that they actually from, obtained from the hospital and clinics, the healthcare professionals, 21% from the electronic media, and 25% from social media as well on asking them where we would prefer to obtain the best healthcare and medical information on kidney disease. 86% still wanted to, to get it from the hospital and clinics. 37% of them from electronic media and 33% of print media. A lot of 32% on social media and 32% on website. I guess one can actually perhaps lump some of this together, although social media is quite a different entity. So what I'd like to temporarily conclude is that the overall uh, they, uh, information that we find from the whole group, actually, our whole group. Of course, we need subgroup analysis. Patients want to know about how to protect the kidneys, common cause, kidney functions. They want to know about communication, which is very good. And interestingly, they want to know about alternative medicine. And of course, their interest is on transplantation. Overall, they want to know how to live well, eat well, and keep fit. Patients wish to get the information from the healthcare professional. This is very important. These are the people that they trust. Uh, they want to get it from the electronic media or website. Um, uh, they mentioned about social media. I'll come back to that. Social media as a as a role to play for providing information. 
printed matter 33%, and other patients, interesting, 23%. From that, I would like to make a, 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 a temporary uh, proposal that uh, there's a need to enhance the skill of healthcare professionals to transfer knowledge because that's where uh, from whom the patient actually wants the information from. We need a more effective and efficient way for healthcare professionals to provide the healthcare information through mass transfer. We need, I would propose that we need to promote online webinar website for various reasons. One. They, they, they can be delivered by healthcare professional, and that's what the patient wants. They are factual and trust information. Uh, in, in, in this, it's different from social media, which can be written by anyone. Webinar record, recordings can be posted on website. Information can be assessed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and for anywhere in the world. And of course, the content is in the format that the receiver can, can understand, and the best to co-design this with the patients, sharing their stories, and to be interactive. The editorial in the Kidney International also have this diagram, highlight the importance of kidney information um, and uh, the use of social media for education awareness and the need to update with accurate data and to identify and remove misinformation. I, I take the view that social media is important because it can actually draw the, everyone's attention to important information, but perhaps a structured website and webinar and those sorts of things would be a better means to trans, transmit uh, factual information to the patient that can be relied on. I'd just like to share with you, uh, in view of this uh, working day program, we have already started on the work by providing information for patients. Hong Kong Kidney Foundation, Hong Kong Society of Nephrology, Hong Kong Association of Renal Nurses Collaborative uh, provide, uh, produce uh, nine episodes of online webinar every other Tuesday night through Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube. And the recording are posted on Hong Kong Kidney Foundation. We we'll also post the PowerPoint as well. The English version will be posted very soon. We're also posting the, the, the link to all the webinars through the newspaper website, and we're so surprised that we've over 4 million hit by people uh, from near the, in the region. Uh, this is the uh, poster that we use. I just this in Chinese, but I'd just like to share with you the, the concept behind it, saying that kidney disease is like climbing a mountain, but there are many roads. So the patient needs to know the different stage from uh, knowing your kidneys, the uh, kidney failure, and such kidney failure for dialysis, transplant, hemodialysis, and peritonitis, and later on, uh, barrier free dialysis, living well with kidney disease, and work together uh, as partners. So this is the concept that we're being used. Um, this is a topic which I already just briefly mentioned already. It was so good that we've got so many nephrologists supporting this program, and also the renal nurses as well. Hong Kong Kidney Foundation will launch a World Kidney Online uh, platform uh, to set up a series of online webinars for healthcare professionals and also for healthcare providers, organization and foundation, so that we can provide factual information for the patients in the way that they, they, they would like to, to obtain from. Um, I would like to end by saying that with the other quote from the uh, editorial, kidney organizations should work towards shifting the patient deficit to have that literacy narrative to that of being the responsibility of healthcare provider and health, health policy makers. And to do that, we need to understand uh, what the patient needs, how they want to know it. I hence my title to connect and be connected. I acknowledge all the contribution from Hong Kong Clinic Foundation, Hong Kong Society of Nephrology, in particular, Dr. Jen Yuklan, who done all the, most of the analysis and Hong Kong Association of Renal Nurse. I also thank the members of the International Society to work in alliance for joining this part of study. This call for further elaboration and further study on, on, the, on the initial finding that we actually have identified. I thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Dr. Lu. That was excellent, highly educational. Now, before we start our discussions, we have two more short presentations. We're going to switch now uh, from Hong Kong, China, going all the way down to a great place, a great country, Nigeria, where our colleague, Ms. Beatrice Segun Agbula, is there to present. Uh, she's a dedicated nurse from central Nigeria, talking on how kidney healthcare professionals can be engaged in health literacy. Beatrice. Good day, everyone, and happy World Kidney Day 2022. 
I am Beatrice Chegwangola, and I'm going to be talking about how kidney healthcare professionals can be engaged in improving patients' health literacy. Health literacy refers to the level of ability an individual possesses to acquire, to process, to understand information and services in order to make informed and appropriate decisions about their health and well-being. Different ways of improving health illiteracy can come through the media, the internet, the television, radio, newspapers, and magazines. With this, so many information can be elicited from this. At least 25% of patients with chronic kidney disease have limited health literacy. And because of this, they can develop more complications, they can develop faster kidney deterioration, and they can have poor kidney transplantation outcome as a result of limited health literacy. However, there are some basic health literacy skills that need to be available to patients with chronic kidney disease, such as the ability to read, the ability to write and understand numbers, ability to communicate with healthcare workers when they have issues to discuss, and also the ability to be able to use technology in order to improve their health. Who has low literacy in health? People with low socioeconomic status have been implicated to have low health literacy. People with low English proficiency, we know that English is a lingua franca of most of the world now, and most prints are actually communicated in English language. So people with low proficiency in English, they have issues with health literacy. Beneficiaries of public finance health coverage, the elderly, because of the limitation of what they have access to. Rural area dwellers, people who dwell in the communities, people who live in communities. Now, what is the importance of health literacy in improving kidney care? It helps individuals to take the right decisions about things around them, such as what do they eat, when to visit the hospital, decisions to make, such as whether to smoke or not. This helps people to take informed decisions. Also, the ability to read labels on food items and drugs. As we know, chronic kidney disease patients have a lot of limitations in terms of food, medications, and fluid. So they need to understand what the labels on different kinds of food items, what it is contained in it or in them. There should also be the ability to report symptoms to healthcare professionals whenever they feel down. They should be able to assess healthcare professionals and explain exactly what the problem is. There should be the ability to locate their nearest health centers where they can assess healthcare. They should be able to understand the available health insurances and health policies available to them, because if they don't, then they can't assess such privileges. They should also have the ability and the wherewithal to pay their medical bills. Now, who needs health literacy? Everybody does. Everybody needs to be literate when it comes to their health status. Individuals, families, communities, health givers, insurers, employers of labor, and the government needs to be educated about their health. Now, what are the effects of limited health literacy? When people do not have enough information about their health, there will be reduced use of preventive services, such as we have today, the World Kidney Day activities. People may not be able to assess such activities if they have limited health literacy. There could also be ineffective management of chronic risk factors. Most of patients with chronic kidney disease 
are usually harvested from patients with hypertension and diabetes. You know, chronic kidney disease, most of the time is a complication of another disease. So when there is limited health literacy, there will be ineffective management of the risk for chronic kidney disease. There could also be low rates of treatment compliance. When there is limited health literacy, people may not be able to comply with lifestyle modifications and their diet. And of course, another effect is medication errors. There could also be longer hospital stays for patients because they become sick more often than usual. There will be increased hospital admissions and poor responsiveness to public health emergencies, such as in time of epidemics, they just don't know what to do because of the limited health literacy. Then of course, morbidity and mortality would be very high. Now, how can healthcare professionals be engaged in improving patients' health literacy? First and foremost, there'll be simplicity in information on kidney disease by the use of various methods such as sprints, jingles, oral and electronic health information should be easy for them to understand, for everyone to understand actually. There should also be access to educational facilities and health reform should be more patient-centered. Education should be provided to improve literacy in the community through advocacy to the government. The healthcare can actually advocate with the government so that education can be provided to the grassroots. There should also be motivation through some incentives. For example, scholarships should be provided. People will be encouraged to go to school. Then there should be provision of a more frequent avenue for learning about kidney disease prevention, not only on what kidney days like today. Then there should be an expansion of the scope of information related to some particular diseases, such as hypertension and the diabetes, people should be informed. In summary, it should be noted that health literacy is key to improving better outcome in kidney care and the health status of the community at large. And conclusively, to improve the health literacy of patients with chronic kidney disease, there should be a collaboration which should be effective, and there should be a synergy between the patients, healthcare professionals, the government who are mostly the policy makers in different countries, financial providers, and of course, researchers should all be involved in health literacy of patients with chronic kidney disease. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Agbula. <clears throat> We're fortunate to, to have you here today. We have one more quick uh, presentation. Uh, We're now going back from Africa uh, all the way down to Europe, where we join uh, with Mr. Paul Laffey, who has been uh, serving as the ISN Advocacy Director and also He's the uh, World Kidney Day Project Director, one of the two project directors and a member of the uh, Joint Steering Committee of the World Kidney Day. Uh, Paul is based in Europe, usually in South France. So let's listen to Paul's pre presentation. Hello, everyone. I'm Paul Laffin, the ISN's Advocacy Director, and I'm going to speak about advocating for better kidney health key principles and top tips. Before I begin, I can advise that I have no conflicts of interest to declare. The first thing that I should mention is that I am not a nephrologist nor a medical doctor of any kind. I am, however, a social policy graduate from Trinity College Dublin, have an MSc in environmental policy from Oxford University, and have spent the entirety of my career working in the public policy sector. This includes eight years running the British Medical Association's Brussels office as its EU public affairs manager, during which time I led several successful international advocacy campaigns. For example, successfully mitigating the damage done by Brexit, the United Kingdom's departure from the EU, to the European medical profession and the patients it serves. As you can imagine, there are a lot of similarities between such campaigns and the ISN's efforts to tackle the global burden of kidney disease through advocacy and collaboration with global partners like those involved in the WKD campaign. Accordingly, I'm going to talk about the transferable key principles and top tips 
for successful advocacy to tackle the global burden of kidney disease. Before I do so, please take a few seconds to remind yourselves what advocacy is. It's synonymous with public affairs or the more pejorative term lobbying, but at its heart, they're all an activity by an individual group that aims to influence decisions within political, economic or social institutions. When doing so, as in all walks of life, you only get one chance to make a first impression with, in what's known as the 90-90 rule, the first 90 seconds accounting for 90% of that immediate reaction. So, other than the obvious points, like dressing appropriately and speaking clearly, how does this apply to advocacy? Quite simply, it's about convincing the decision maker that you're worth listening to and can help them deliver mutually beneficial outcomes. If you can't do this, and I speak as somebody who couldn't on many occasions during my early career, then you'll struggle to recover and leave the meeting with a positive outcome. The best way to do so is to develop an elevator pitch. That's to say, in a jargon-free manner, be able to articulate the problem or opportunity, explain what the policy solution is, how you can help deliver it, and detail what the mutual benefits, especially to patients, will be in the time that it takes to make a short journey in an elevator. For example, explain that dialysis patients have much higher rates of infection and mortality from COVID-19 than the general population, and describe why this is. Outline how their prioritization, as a result of political pressure, within vaccination programs will decrease these rates, thereby saving lives and alleviating pressure on other parts of the health service. You can then expand upon these points once you've got the decision maker's full attention. Experience has taught me that perhaps the most important point to focus on is, unsurprisingly, how your proposal will benefit patients, who, after all, can vote and ultimately help a politician to keep their job. I've been in situations where I've metaphorically lost the room because I wasn't able to clearly demonstrate patient support for the policy solutions that I was proposing. This most definitely is not the case with WKD. With the ISN's recently launched Patient Liaison Advisory Group and its members from each of the society's 10 regions and the International Federation of Kidney Foundation representing patient groups from 41 countries, the patient perspective is fully embedded within the WKD campaign. Having made a positive first impression and convinced the decision maker that you're worth listening to, it's imperative to demonstrate that you understand the system you're trying to shape. Firstly, you need to do your research and make sure that you're speaking to the person who can actually influence the policy you're trying to shape. Bureaucracies and parliaments are complex institutions. So, and again, I speak from experience, it's hugely embarrassing to your, and detrimental to your cause to be told, thanks for coming, but you really should be speaking to my colleagues. You should also do some research on the policymakers' track record. For example, do they have personal connections, a family member with CKD, for instance, to kidney health, or have they voted favorably on recent relevant pieces of legislation? The ability to drop such facts into your discussion not only helps build a personal connection, but emphasizes your professionalism, thereby increasing the likelihood of securing support for your proposal. It's also imperative to understand the legislative or policy process that you're seeking to influence and the current political climate in which you'll be operating. Demonstrating an understanding of how such processes operate and what needs to be done to secure your proposal serves to further strengthen your credibility and increases the chances of securing support for your cause. At the most basic level, for example, and for once this isn't, isn't something that I've done myself, one should not ask a health minister to begin developing an expensive dialysis program from scratch two months before a general election and during a period of financial austerity. As I mentioned, I'm not a doctor and so cannot draw my personal clinical experience when speaking with policymakers who themselves almost certainly will not be nephrologists. As nephrologists or allied health professionals, this is your superpower and isn't something that you should be modest about as it gives you an enormous advantage during the discussion. I've been challenged many times by astute politicians who have asked about my personal experience of healthcare delivery, but have been able to turn the tables by diverting the question to a clinician who is my clinical foil and who provided a suitably robust response. Your ability to talk about the impact of healthcare policy on yourself or on your patients, particularly if you've just come from the hospital or clinic, and use this experience to convince policymakers should not be underestimated either. Of course, 
It's equally important to do so in simple, jargon-free language that allows the policymakers to understand the issues from the outset, whilst also presenting yourself as an approachable source of expertise. Your arguments, based on your clinical expertise and experience as patients or clinicians, can be further strengthened by the targeted use of both qualitative and quantitative data. Like any other group of people, policymakers have a range of personality types and think in different ways. So, and again, this will require research, it's important to be prepared to present the evidence to both the more analytical left brain people and the more emotional right brain group. That's to say, be prepared to use case study material which demonstrates the human impact of health policy upon named individuals from within the policymakers' jurisdiction and back this up with the use of relevant, citable, empirical facts. Being able to cite a recently published article from a high-profile publication can be particularly effective. So, and building on the elevator pitch of dialysis patients having much higher rates of infection and mortality from COVID-19 than the general population, a North American could cite the December 2021 ProPublica piece, which details how the pandemic killed so many dialysis patients in the USA that their total number shrank for the first time in nearly half a century. I cannot, though, emphasize how important it is to have both types of data and for it to be both up to date and locally specific. If it's not, and if the policymaker is worth their salt, then, and again, as I've experienced firsthand, they can easily debunk your arguments if they so wish and seriously reduce your chances of success. Having been on the other side of the debate, so to speak, as a policy advisor, as a policy advisor to a member of the European Parliament, I cannot overstate the importance of ensuring that you're speaking with one voice as a unified profession and set of patient advocates. Nothing is more off-putting to a politician or his staff who often act as the gatekeepers than being approached by different representatives from the same sector, all wanting to speak about the same or a similar issue. Those who synchronize and ensure that the different sections of the profession and patients groups are coordinated and aligned will secure those meetings and can expect a favorable hearing. Those who don't, often don't even get in the door. So do reach out to the WKD team when considering such efforts, as we can help with the coordination and ensure that there are no unhelpful duplication of efforts. Everything I've just talked about must be done as part of a structured advocacy campaign, which will need to include a significant focus on external communications. In the modern world, and with the health advocacy space being hotly contested, it's no longer enough to speak with the policymakers themselves. It's vital that the media, both print and social, help to am amplify your message. Without them helping to change the political climate, it's all but impossible to secure significant policy change. Indeed, demonstrating success in advocacy is challenging, which is why we at the ISN aim for textual success. That's to say, unless the legislative or policy text has been amended or been prevented from being changed to reflect your interests, then your campaign hasn't been successful. This is an exacting standard, but underpins our global advocacy strategy. And working hand in glove with the WKD campaign is something that we're aiming to apply to our advocacy efforts. For example, and via the ISN status as a non-state actor in official relations with the WHO, we have a long-term objective of securing changes to its fact sheets, which, as you can see, incredibly neglect to mention either kidney or renal disease. Developing and implementing such a successful advocacy campaign will not be easy, nor should you or we expect to see immediate results as changing policy can take months, if not years. Nevertheless, and whatever your advocacy goal, your expertise and experience as patients and clinicians will be vital to tackling the global burden of kidney disease. The ISN and the WKD team is here to help, its, help you and look forward to bridging the gaps of available kidney care through advocacy and collaboration with the WKD campaign team and its supporters. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Paul. So we had great presentations. Uh, many of them, all of them actually were highly educational after these uh, extremely exceptional educational and uh, thought stimulating presentations. Let's start with the panel discussion and uh, addressing some questions. So we have uh, most of our speakers here. Uh, I would like to start with this. Uh, 
I see here a number of questions. Let me see this one. Why did we or they or founding fathers or founding parents, uh, why did we create the Working Day initiatives? And what, what is its uh, purpose? And how can this now contribute to kidney care education? So let me start with uh, Professor, uh, okay, where are you? Oh, Dr. Agnes Fogo, Professor Fogo. So what, do, what is your understanding and expectations from World Kidney Day? My expectations are that people will feel ownership of knowing what a healthy kidney is, that just like everybody knows what their blood pressure and cholesterol will be, they know some basic facts about heart disease, they know some things about smoking and lung cancer, people will know that there is something called creatinine. They will know that there is something called protein in the urine. They will know that the kidneys affect the other organs and they will know this is something they should care about and ask their doctor to make sure it's checked. So my goal is to have this awareness. And I can tell you that I, I joined the call a little bit late because I was calling back urgent biopsies to clinicians and each of the nephrologists outside Vanderbilt whom I called, I said, I hope that you are feeling appreciated today. It's World Kidney Day. And some of them said, oh, I forgot, or oh, yes, that's right, or yes, it is. I would hope that we would all have this first and foremost on our agenda, that we would all know that it's World Kidney Day, that this would be not just within our profession, but other people would know it's World Kidney Day, and it would be as natural a part of our common knowledge, regardless of our level of health literacy, that there are some things we can ask our doctors about and be proactive about. Those are my goals. What about you? All right, so in, uh, now that you're asking what about me, I'm going to actually forward this question to Dr. S.F. Louis. What about you, Dr. Yeah, Louis? Um, I think Anne has already outlined some of the reasons, but let me take you back a bit. I was actually involved with the beginning. That was 18 years ago, a long, long time ago. I'm quite old man now. Uh, Hong Kong actually had the Hong Kong Kidney Day in 2001 and 2004, and at the time, some of us was talking together. There must be a World Kidney Day, just like everything else. There's a World Hepatitis Day, but no World Kidney Day. Well, that's another question. We need to take WHO to have a WHO World Kidney Day. But coming back to some 18 years ago, Joe Copper was the one who actually connect all those things between IFKF and ISNN. Um, now, now, at this moment, we now say that's one in 10 people around the world, doesn't matter where you are, have some degree of kidney disease. It wasn't that much then, but it was a very major problem because treatment is so difficult, it's so expensive. That was one of the reasons why we started. Let me end by saying that currently we are trying to focus every one of the World Kidney Day, the theme is a challenge. There's so many topics that we need to talk about. But may I just say that from my personal perspective, there's two major themes. One is provide better kidney health for all, as Anna says, so of prevention, detection, and early treatment. The second one is we must provide better care for patients with kidney disease. Those are two major things. It's amazing that you are uh, touching based on the two themes of the 2020 and 2021 World Kidney Days. That is prevention mm -hmm. from 2020 and, and living well with kidney disease in 2021. Now, bringing this back to Dr. Bonner, who is our special guest of this year and who is the main expert behind uh, this year's theme. So, Anne, what what would you what would be your expectations from the uh, resources and from the first of all the concept of World Kidney Day and resources that this World Kidney Day and opportunities that it it probably pr uh, uh, bring to us and place at our disposal and and what would you suggest? Where should this platform continue to evolve? Thanks very much, Cam. It's a real privilege and an honour to be um, invited this year. I'm a kidney nurse of over 30 years and you know what has struck me as well as a as a teacher academic is that we, we often give information, communicate information to our patients, we try to teach our patients but we, we don't really um, try to assess their ability to understand and use that information. And to me, that's what health literacy is about. It's about acknowledging that everybody 
brings to the situation, to the clinical appointment, to see their doctor, to see their nurse, their allied health professional um, with varying health literacy abilities. It's not based on how far through school somebody went because people may never have been to school but still acquire a way of understanding the world and processing information and if we use those principles um, when we're dealing with patients and their family all of the time I think that's where we will bridge the gap and um, bring kidney care um, to the person rather than just focusing on the numbers, you know, the fluid numbers, the creatinine numbers, the potassium numbers, and it brings it to what's meaningful for the person. And then they're more likely to um, adapt to their kidney problems, to be able to adjust their lifestyle um, and adhere to the sorts of really complex treatment that we ask them to adhere to. Even lifestyle modifications are very challenging for people to put into their ordinary uh, daily lives. So that's what I hope um, comes from this theme this year. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bonner. I, I mean, you, you describe yourself as a, just a kidney nurse while you are the dean of the medical school is one of the top medical, uh, I'm sorry, nursing school, one of the top nursing schools. Uh, uh, internationally recognized. So I'm going to uh, also start the second question with yourself. Since you mentioned, since you're an expert in, in, kidney, in health literacy, what are the key measures? Uh, and, and if I could expand on this question that came from one of the colleagues, expanding health literacy, the conventional traditional uh, definition, I mean, how you, you read and understand your prescription, that's the function of health literacy versus what we in 2022 should really expect, different levels of health literacy. So could you, exp could you expand on this uh, and, and educate yeah. us? Yeah, look, uh, yeah. Um, look health literacy is, is, is probably, um, it's, it's like when we um, uh, teach, you know, students or we, we teach patients, we teach the way that we were taught. And that's not necessarily the right way to go about things. Um, so as, as clinicians, we often haven't been trained as educators. So it's getting that additional training around, particularly about adult learning theories, about how do adults want to learn, and then putting those principles into practice. And there's some really simple things that can be done that are, don't cost anything, such as uh, teach back where you know it's not a quiz or a test of patients, but it's a way to gauge their understanding of the information that we've been trying to, to share. And you know, just simply asking the person, oh, you know, I'm just curious as to um, how you might explain that um, information I've just told you to your, your family or your friends, and can you explain it back to me? And so um, it gauges quickly their level of understanding, and then that can be reinforced or added to and developed, and also, you know, um, demonstrating skills. You know, we all know that patients, when if they do their uh, dialysis at home, whether home hemodialysis or home peritoneal dialysis, they are often very much more actively engaged and understand what's going on. It's because doing, doing the uh, dialysis themselves, they have to develop that problem solving, those critical health literacy abilities. But I think underneath all of this is communication. Communication is the key. We need to communicate at the right levels um, for every single patient. And that's adjusting the levels. Um, if I took all of us out of our comfort zone in kidney care and placed us all in the haematology department um, and trying to make a decision as to which would be the best treatment option, we would be confused as to whether we were, should be taking treatment options A, B, C or D. So even our health literacy gets challenged when we're out of our comfort zone. So if we think of that, we think of it as a universal precautions um, approach. Well, it's just very uh, simple strategies like that. And I think fundamentally, and I'm sorry, I'll, I'll finish in a moment, it's the organisations that we work in. It's the organisations that need to empower the clinicians to take this approach. There needs to be the policymakers, including that as part of what we do. And I was just highlighting a couple of examples from the US and here in Australia where it is 
a requirement for organisations to really embed health literacy practices. Well, very nicely said. I'm going to now <clears throat> share the uh, second question with uh, Professor Fogel. So uh, this is a question here. What is the best format for patients and their care partners to improve the level of understanding and education? And, and if it comes from you as a pathologist who, tr who tries, you try very hard to share with us uh, very sophisticated observations in, in histopathology with us nephrologists who don't quite understand the level of your insight and you change it to the language that we understand. So now going back to this question, what's the best format for patients and their care partners to better understand the uh, uh, matters related to kidney disease and in which format? Well, as you know, Cam, I don't often talk directly with patients, but I'm very happy to do so. And sometimes they do call me to get a better understanding of the biopsy. And I use a lot of metaphors. I think Anne touched on this, that you have to use language that makes sense. So whether I'm talking to the nephrology fellows or the medical students or sometimes patients or lay people, I might say we have deposits, these are bad things that land in your kidney in the filtering units. And there are things that we call humps. They look like Monet's haystacks. And some of all of these things that I say, I will use things that are common analogies and use a normal English language and not technical terms in explaining what is going on. I, when I teach, which I enjoy very much doing, I often use little theater plays where we pretend to be different cells or deposits and have people go through what would happen if this did. I um, think that having people be interactive, having them think through with you, and as Anne said, teach back, maybe not in a quiz-like way, but I want to make sure that I've explained this well enough. Can you tell me how you would explain this to your other person, you're whatever other person that is, how would you explain that? And I want to make sure that I did a good enough job explaining it to you. Not, I want to make sure you understand it well enough, but did I do a good enough job explaining this to you so that it's useful to you and makes sense? So it, it, I don't really have one answer because it depends very, very much on the person and their age. Some of the millennials that I teach, they want TikTok length videos, they want short bullet points. Uh, they don't usually ask me if it's going to be on the test because they know that that makes me cringe. But they, they want algorithmic straight things that are straightforward. Uh, more senior, older people want to kind of mull over in a different way and use different things. But I think just the, the key point is not to use specialist language and is to be able to communicate in a language or with metaphors that make sense to people. If I'm talking to somebody who's a mechanic or works with their hands or with carpentry, I might use metaphors that make sense to them. If I'm talking with somebody who farms and gardens, I might use metaphors that make sense to them. So well said. I, I just learned, I, I noticed that I use that same strategy, not infrequently use, using metaphors. And then what you also said, as Studley alluded to, it's, uh, it's the definition, I think, the interactive health literacy, right? In, 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 that means one level above functional health literacy to teach back and, and to repeat. Now, let's move on with the next question for Dr. S.F. Louis. What do you think, uh, uh, S.F., what are the key challenges to healthcare professionals and organizations communicating and educating more effectively? So at the level of, especially, uh, 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 organizations such as kidney foundations or health organizations, health systems in the United States, we have Kaiser Permanente or, or certain things. What, what have we failed and what we should learn and, and improve? That is a very important and good question. Um, I actually cover part of that in my talk as well. I think the challenge of us, the clinician and the whole healthcare professionals is the lack of time. We've got so many patients to see and in the clinic, you already got five minutes and the nurses may be a bit more. So to me, it's very important that uh, for the healthcare profession to, to do two things is 
want to brush up your, I won't say brush up, but enhance your skill to how to communicate very effectively on a one-to-one -one basis. But to me, it's more important. Why do we re repeat and repeat the same message to the same, different patients at different time or from different hospitals? They all say the same thing. That's why you literally, we need a very effective mass transfer information. Uh, such as on a webinar, then you can, I can invite two doctors, two of the top specialists from Hong Kong and share the, the view on those things. And everyone in Hong Kong can listen to it. Why we have to do, do this so many times? I think we need to call for effective efficiency of the whole way we actually communicate and share information with patients. Thank you. Uh, I see that Beatrice is back. So if you can hear us, Beatrice, uh, so uh, what would you, uh, in, in with regard to the last two questions about communication, I mean, it's hard to communicate and educate more effectively, interactively, and also what would you expect from organizations, including those you work mm -hmm. with in Nigeria, in Africa? Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just say, say that one of the ways that we improved health literacy in Nigeria here, uh, well, is to go to the communities. For example, we have a lot of people who are rural dwellers in Nigeria, people who dwell, I mean, who live in the rural areas and they do not have access to most of this, um, most of these print materials or even expose, exposure to information that can actually help them. So what we do, for example, today on World Kidney Day in Nigeria is we actually go to, this, to the grassroots, to the community to inform them, to educate them. And one of the ways that we educate them, especially for people who are not, uh, who do not possess the skill of, um, you know, language barrier, they cannot speak English and all of that. So. What we do is we speak in the local language. Also, we act some dramas. Like today, we had a lot of uh, interaction with people and we act what we're actually trying to communicate to them. So when they see it in the drama form, it is actually easier for them to relate with the information we're trying to pass across to them. So, and then on what kidney day, we do a lot of this. We do a lot of advocacy as well, even with the government to support so that we can actually bring a lot of things to the table. We go around and we, we talk to them. We speak to them in the language that they understand. So that is uh, one of the ways that we have been able to improve health literacy, especially in the communities in Nigeria. Wow, that was uh, so well done and said, thank you. And we, we continue to interact and learn from uh, countries that have uh, more challenges with, uh, uh, with some of the educational aspects. And we learn, we in Western countries, actually we learn from those models and bring it back. So with that in mind, I would like to ask colleagues to, with this last question, uh, this is about your final message and this will be recorded and, and shared and watched by many in coming days to weeks. So what is your personal message for World Kidney Day and its 2022 theme from now on? So let me start with uh, Agnes, uh, Dr. Fogo. What's your personal message? Thank you for all that you do to help us care for all of us in all regards and particularly to focus on your kidney health. Very nicely said, thank you. And Dr. Louis. Uh, to everyone around the world, one, know your kidneys. And secondly, do you look after your kidneys? Thank you, Dr. Louis. Dr. Ann Bonner, Professor Bonner. I also say thank you to everybody of what you're doing. I think keep the voice active, raise the awareness, don't give up. Thank you, and Beatrice. Okay, thank you very much. I will say we are doing a wonderful job, especially on World Kidney Day. I want to say let's continue for emphasis. 
Thank you. With these great messages, I would like to conclude our today's presentation. This was the World Kidney Day 2022, bridging the gap with focus on health literacy. Please don't forget that World Kidney Day will be continued to be celebrated, not just today, but from now on through the remainder of the year 2022. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.